You're watching NASA TV. Good morning and thanks for joining us here at NASA's Johnson Space Center. I'm Chelsea Bayarte and today we're talking about two upcoming spacewalks, both with the goal of upgrading the space station's power channel. So for those following along at home, you may hear the acronym EVA, uh, that's extravehicular activity, or simply put, a spacewalk. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So NASA astronauts Steve Bowen and Woody Hoberg will put their spacesuits on and exit the International Space Station on a set of two upcoming spacewalks. The first is scheduled to take place uh, Friday, June 9th, and the second for June 15th. This, the June 9th spacewalk will be the ninth spacewalk for Bowen and the first in the career of Woody Hoberg. Here with me today to talk about these upcoming spacewalks are our briefers, Dina Cantella, Operations, Man Operations Integration Manager for the International Space Station Program, Diane Daly, Spacewalk Flight Director, and Megan Schutica, Spacewalk Officer. So I'll turn it over to them for some opening remarks in just a minute, um, but first, if you wanna get your questions ready, please press star one on the phone to indicate that you have a, a question, or press star two if your question has already been answered and you want to lower your hand. Uh, for those tuning in on social media, please submit your questions using hashtag AskNASA. Our great social media team here at NASA's Johnson Space Center will be sending me your questions, so we'll be on the lookout for them. Uh, so let's turn it over to our briefers for their opening remarks. Dina? All right. Thank you, Chelsea. And thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Um, so before we talk about the spacewalks, which is the purpose of today's briefing, I did just want to talk a little bit about what's been going on on board the International Space Station. Since I was last here in late April, uh, to start, we've had three spacewalks. And uh, the first one was a US operating segment spacewalk. And if you recall from our previous briefing, there were two major objectives. One was to prep for these June spacewalks that they're going to tell you about. So get some struts prepared and some cabling and some tools. And um, we had Steve and Sultan outside, and they did a great job prepping all of that for us. And so we're really set up well coming into these uh, spacewalks. We also um, wanted to bring an antenna inside for future refurbishment. Uh, we had a stuck bolt though. We couldn't get it off the mechanism, the interface, and um, we are working up alternative methods for a future spacewalk that we'll brief you on before that spacewalk happens. We're pretty confident we're going to be able to get it off. Um, we just didn't have the, the right um, tools nor the um, expectation of what was going to happen while we were out there. Um, but more details to come on that, and it's really not an impact that, our, uh, that we're late and that's fair, uh, bringing that home. And so we've also had two Russian spacewalks, both highly successful. Uh, the Russians have also launched a cargo ship, 84 Progress, and docked it successfully. And we've relocated uh, the Dragon crewed vehicle from one port to another. So a lot's happened, um, but I, I really would like to um, talk a little bit about the Axiom mission that we just completed uh, over the past couple of weeks. Uh, it was a private astronaut mission, our second, um, called Axiom 2, and essentially ISS had four house guests on board. Um, these crew members were very professional. They did a lot of science, a, a lot of um, great student outreach uh, and other activities while they were on board. Uh, about nine dock days and a um, highly successful mission. They just splashed down on Tuesday night, so I want to congratulate the Axiom team the SpaceX team and the NASA teams for uh, this great mission that happened last month in May. And now, we've setting our, now we're setting our sights on SpaceX 28. That launch, is a, it's a cargo vehicle, and it launches um, Saturday at 11.35 a.m. Houston local time, and it'll dock on Monday at 4.36 a.m., uh, again, Houston local time. It's carrying cargo, supplies, science, uh, and importantly for this, particular press briefing, the uh, two ISS rollout solar arrays that we're going to be installing and deploying. Um, so we're looking forward to that mission, um, and um, hopefully we can get some good weather over the weekend to, to make that happen for us. Um, so we're here today to talk about the two spacewalks. Um, as was mentioned, we have Steve and Woody. Steve is extremely experienced, again, his ninth spacewalk, um, and, uh, and Woody, it's his first. Um, so, uh, but they're both very well trained, and in fact, this week on board ISS, they're working on um, studying and their procedures and working on the spacesuits and getting those ready. So we're on the, quote, road to EVA. 
And so to talk the details of all of that, though, I'm going to hand it over to uh, first to Diane Daly, who is our lead uh, spacewalk flight director. Thank you, Dina. Um, uh, I'm Diane Daly. I'll be leading the first of the two uh, EVAs that we've got coming up. Um, this EVA set is really a series of EVAs, um, and it's a continuing continuation of the ongoing power augmentation that we're doing on the space station. So this will be the third set of IROSAs that we're going to be installing on station. Um, and thankfully to those previous EVAs, uh, we've got the scaffolding and the, um, we call them the mod kits, already in place out at the One Alpha and One Bravo locations where we'll be installing these two solar arrays. So once they arrive on SpaceX 28, um, they're going to be coming up in the Dragon trunk and they'll be positioned on station. Um, and the tasks of the EVAs are really focused on a couple of major objectives. The first is um, getting the, the arrays out of that scaffolding, out of that um, called flight support equipment that's holding the, the two arrays coming up. Um, so the crew has some steps to go and remove bolts and launch restraints that are holding it in place, um, and then getting those arrays out to their final locations, um, getting them fully unfolded and deployed. Um, this series of EVAs uh, is a little bit different than some of the previous series that we've done, just in terms of where the two sets of arrays are going to be located. Um, in previous sets of IROSA EVAs, we did outboard arrays, um, kind of at the furthest end of the station and truss. Um, and then we've done some that were on either side, port and starboard side. Um, and so these two arrays are going to be um, one kind of more inboard, that's the one alpha array, and then the further one that's outboard, which is the one bravo array. And so that combination um, means that there are some similarities and some differences, which Megan will talk to a little bit more in detail about how we actually get the arrays out to the positions and get them installed. Um, but the overall operations involve robotics. They involve all of our crew members. So we've got Woody Hoberg uh, and Steve will be going out the door. Um, but inside, Sultan and Frank will be very involved as well, um, both in getting the crew members suited up and ready to go outside, but then also flying the robotic arm um, and supporting throughout the EVA as well to help. Um, it's an overall kind of all hands on deck team effort to, to have success with these EVAs. Um, the two EVAs are linked um, in that I mentioned that the, the flight support equipment that's coming up um, that's holding those two arrays, um, we have to, to clear out the first uh, array so that we can get to that second array, and there are some support beams in between those two. Um, and so at the conclusion of the first EVA, um, one of the last things the crew's going to do is move some of those support beams out of the way in order for us to be able to access that lower, um, that lower solar array. Um, and that just is going to set us up for success um, on the second EVA. They're, they're a little bit longer EVAs, so we've got um, quite a number of objectives, but we've got a, a great team and a great set of procedures, and we're really leveraging the experience that we have from the previous IROSA installation EVAs to, to allow us to be successful, to allow us to accomplish all the objectives um, that we have that day. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to Megan to talk a little bit more detail about um, what we're actually going to be doing and what the crew's going to be um, getting their hands on during the EVA. Thanks, Diane. So as Diane mentioned, we have the two EVAs, the one Alpha and the one Bravo. The first set is getting that top IROSA off of its flight support equipment, the FSC, and we'll be relocating it to that inboard array that'll be on what we call the S4, the starboard side four segment. I will have a video here shortly that will go through that first EVA in more detail, and so that will give a very good high-level view. Um, in slide 15, we have a picture of what the IROSA hardware looks like as crew will approach it. That is going to be a very large folded up array. There's two of those we're dealing with, and so crew's job is to relocate those onto structure, onto what we are calling the mod kit. And then they will have to work together to unfold and prep it for deployment. These are unique in that they do roll out for deployment, and so we have a graphic as well that shows in slide 16 what that looks like once crew gets it in place. Those will extend out and they will deploy as uh, previous sets have done, and we'll be doing that for both the One Alpha and One Bravo. Uh, at this point, I'll let us go through the animation that we have for EVA-1. And then I can talk some of the unique deltas that we have for the second EVA since it's at a further out position on station. This video is for the ISIS Rollout Solar Ray, or IROSA, 1A install EVA. Steve Bowen, EV1 with the red stripes, egresses and receives a crew lock bag and puts it on his body restraint tether. EV2 with white stripes, Woody Hoberg, egresses with the crew lock bag on his body restraint tether and closes the thermal cover. EV-1 translates up the forward face of the truss and goes starboard. He stops to configure safety tethers. EV-2 follows a similar translation path 
and goes to the port crew equipment translation aid cart to temporarily stow his bag and retrieve an articulating portable foot restraint. Meanwhile, EB-1 translates to the Irosa carrier, stows his bag, and retrieves his pistol grip tool. EB-1 begins preparing Irosa for removal from the carrier, first releasing a restraint bolt on the upper Irosa. EB-2 relocates the foot restraint and installs it on the space station's robotic arm. EB-2 ingresses the foot restraint, and then the arm will move him away from the truss. EV-1 translates to the lower Irosa and releases its first restraint bolt. He releases both anti-rotation devices back on the upper Irosa, and then will stow them in the crew lock bag. On the robotic arm, EV-2 is flown over to access two sets of bolts on the boom end of the upper Irosa. The first two bolts will allow the boom deployment system rollers to be moved into place to help with the array deployment later in the spacewalk. The second two bolts will release two of four mechanisms that hold the Irosa in its rolled up configuration. EB-1 partially releases the upper Irosa's restraint bolt and installs the first of two handling aids called scoops and prep for removing Irosa from the carrier. The arm flies EV-2 over to the hinge end of the upper Irosa, and both crew members work to release the final bolt holding it to the carrier. EV-1 installs a second scoop, and EV-2 lifts the Irosa off of the carrier. After several maneuvers on the robotic arm, EV-2 will arrive at the 1A mod kit worksite. During these maneuvers, EV-1 will pick up the temporarily stowed bag from the port cart and reconfigure both crew's safety tethers on his way to meet EV-2 at the mod kit. Both crew will then work to install Irosa onto the 1A mounting bracket. The crew will release the scoops, and EV-2 will move into position to release the final bolt holding Irosa in its folded position. Once released, EV-1 will hold Irosa closed while EV-2 egresses his foot restraint and gets into position. Both crew will then work together to unfold Irosa and secure the right side onto the mounting bracket. Once secured, EV-2 will drive two hinge bolts that hold Irosa in the unfolded position. EV-2 will then move away from Irosa to reconfigure a safety tether on the arm. EV-1 works to drive eight bolts to fully secure the Irosa to the mounting bracket. Both crew will then work to electrically connect the new Irosa to the ISS power system. They'll first attach four connectors to Irosa, then both will move to either side of the legacy array to disconnect the old array and connect a Y cable. This will allow power to flow from both the new Irosa and the legacy array to the space station power system. At this point, EV-1 moves into a deployment viewing position and EV-2 will release the final two bolts restraining Irosa in the undeployed position. Irosa will deploy over the next six to 10 minutes. During deployment, EV-1 translates back to the Irosa carrier to reconfigure the carrier beams that previously held the upper Irosa. These beams need to be rotated out of the way to allow access to the lower Irosa on the second EVA. Once deployment is complete, EV-2 will release two bolts that allow the Irosa blankets to become tensioned. EV-2 then cleans up the mod kit worksite retrieving his crew lock bag, and heads to the carrier to help EV-1 with the carrier beams. The crew members will work together to release the bolts holding the beams in place. Then they will rotate the beams out of the way and secure them back down. This is the last task in the first EVA.
aircraft crew will clean up the worksite and translate back to the airlock. They will clean up their tethers on the way. They will then work to ingress and begin repressing the airlock. This will finish the first of two EVAs. Right, so that gives a good overview of the first EVA. Uh, for the second one, it's very similar. Uh, the tasks are the same as far as the actual hardware crew is interfacing with and installing. The difference is going to be we're going to be at the starboard most side of station for the one Bravo channel, as shown earlier. To get out there, our station arm doesn't quite reach all the way, so what we have to do instead for EVA2 is crew will have the, be on the arm and take the IROSA as far as they can over towards one Bravo, and then they will have to do a series of APFR, articulating portable foot restraints, leapfrog maneuvers, essentially handing off the IROSA hardware to each other back and forth across the truss. And so we have a good graphic here of what that actually looked like on the first set of arrays that we did on the port side. So it will be very similar actions for the starboard side. Crew will work together through this leapfrog to get the hardware out, and then all the same steps are required for actually installing and deploying. At the end of the second EVA, they'll be cleaning up, and we'll hopefully have two perfectly installed and working IROSA solar rays. I'll hand it back to uh, moderator. Great, thanks, Megan. Uh, so I think we'll jump into some questions. You guys ready? Ready. All right, awesome. So uh, before you do your question, we'll uh, please state your name, affiliation, and if you can, uh, who your question is directed to. We have Dina, Diane, and Megan in that order. Uh, if you've got a question on the phone, go ahead and press star one. On social media, hashtag ask NASA. We'll be looking out for those. But let's start out in the room. Oh, thank you, uh, Mark Corot with Aviation Week and Space Technology. I believe this is for Dina Cantella. Um, this is been a project that's been in work for a while. Um, can you kind of describe the significance that the completed upgrade with these two installations what means for the space station and its remaining uh, time in operation in orbit? Absolutely. So, you know, over time, our uh, existing legacy arrays, they degrade. Uh, this is expected uh, and normal part of aging. And so the, our ability to uh, augment that power um, is really important for us, uh, especially as we want to continue research um, and eventually we're, we'll be also um, incorporating the Axiom modules as well onto ISS. And so we need to have as much power as possible. Um, so the, this particular set of arrays, in fact, um, is going to overlay one set of arrays where we've actually lost a little bit of our power um, and um, so is exceptionally useful, I'd say. Um, so overall, um, the ability to continue to bring our power up to normal levels and even boost it a little higher for future research is really uh, critical for the space station. So um, we're very excited to have this third of four uh, sets of arrays and um, uh, looking forward to having those installed. We have another question here in the room. Gina Sinceri, ABC News. I'm not sure who wants this. Uh, could you tick-tock for me what's coming up on the cargo supply ship that you need for these spacewalks? We'll go ahead. Yeah, sure. So, so for these spacewalks, the hardware, um, the main hardware that we need is the arrays themselves. Um, so on the previous EVAs that happened um, at the end of or earlier this year, um, the crew got all of the, the kind of support equipment that holds the arrays. That's what's called the mounting bracket on slide 17 there. Um, and so the series of EVAs that happened there, they went ahead and installed those mounting brackets. Um, what the previous EVA that was working with SASA also did was pre-route the cables that we need in order to make those cable connections to um, bring the solar arrays into that, that overall scheme. So the hardware that we really need is the arrays themselves. And so that's why we're really contingent on SpaceX 28 arriving, um, and then we'll be ready to go when they get there. Another question here in the room. Thank you, Mark Corot, Aviation Week and Space Technology again. Uh, once the uh, CRS-28 docks with the station, I as I understand it, the, uh, the Canadian robot arm reaches into the trunk and positions um, the arrays on the outside. Could you tell us where on the truss this will be uh, stationed for the spacewalk? Yep, I'll take it. 
So um, I can answer that. So they'll be located at what we call is work site one. It's the farthest most star starboard uh, position for the arm where it can be based. And that's so we get the most reach out to the farthest starboard for part of the rays. Yeah, so the, so the FSC carrier is gonna be attached to the, the mobile base and on that mobile base um, is the, the POA. It, it's a, an attachment fixture that's on the port side. Um, and so the carrier itself, that FSC placeport equipment will actually be on that POA sitting there and that's where the crew will get the hardware and attach, and attach to. All right, so we'll jump into a social media question here that I've received from Atul Kumar, who wants to know the total duration estimated of the spacewalks and what are the risks that we're looking out for? Sure, so these are uh, long EVAs. Uh, you know, typically we have our EVA durations around six and a half hours. Um, these EVAs, just because of the, the number of tasks we have, we're actually closer to, to six hours and 45 minutes, six hours and 50 minutes planned for these EVAs. Um, we understand all those. Um, and in terms of risk, big picture is that, you know, spacewalks are one of the riskiest things that we do, um, just, just being really honest about it. And it's a, it's a complex operation, um, but it's also one of the reasons that we put a lot of effort into the training um, and into the preparation and into the, uh, you know, a significant amount of rigor into the product development and the analysis and the assessments that go on to make sure that we understand all those different risks um, and that we have a, a, a good understanding of those. And then we have plans in place and mitigations to reduce any risks that we can going in and then also be able to respond to anything that comes up um, and try to anticipate the unexpected as much as possible. I guess I would just add, you know, we are um, handling a very significant mass. The crew is handling a, a very large mass in this case. Um, and you, you can't just very quickly um, move something around that, that's that large. And so if we get into a case where a crew member has an issue with this space suit or something like that, then we'll, we've got specific plans in place of what we'll do. Um, but uh, again, as Diane said, we've, we've got a, a lot of training involved here and a lot of contingency mitigation plans. But uh, that, that would be one of the, the things that's really kind of a watch item on this particular set of, of EVAs is handling large masses like this. Thank you. So we know that spacewalking is a team sport. So um, who's going to be supporting Bone and Hoberg before they go out? What will they be doing? So Frank Rubio and uh, Sultan Al Nayari will be inside station, and so they will be involved. Um, I think even before the Frank and um, sorry before Steve and Woody get going on the day, and they will stay up late after. So they'll be really involved throughout the day. Um, they will be involved with helping the crew get into their spacesuits and get ready to go out the door for the EVA. Um, and then during the spacewalk itself, they'll also be supporting by driving the robotic arm. Um, and so when we have crew members on the arm, um, it is always safest to have the closest possible person in control of that arm. And so that's why uh, Frank Rubio will be our, our primary arm operator. Um, it's, we also have a, a great advantage in Frank's knowledge on this and that he performed the last set of IROSA EVA. So he's very familiar with the tasks um, and can almost kind of provide even additional insight in that um, in having done very, very similar EVA operations himself. Um, and then Sultan will also be supporting. So when we have that, we have a very specific kind of way that we manage the communication with the crew outside. So you'll actually probably hear Sultan talking to the crew while they're out uh, during the spacewalk. Um, and then Frank, that's so he can basically have his hands on the controls on the robotic workstation. Um. Question here in the room? Gina? Yeah. Oh, could you wait for your microphone? <laughs> Gina Sinceri, ABC News for Gina. How crowded is the schedule for the rest of the year between cargo missions and other missions? What kind of a challenge is that? Well, um, you know, I, I think you were, what you're referring to is we have had quite a crowd, I'd say, at station um, with vehicles coming and going and even just trying to, to put the Axie mission, fitting that into the May timeframe prior to Space 628. Um, you know, what, what we're looking forward to is, um, in addition to SpaceX 28, we've got the NG missions sometime this summer, and we're still working out the details of when that will be. Uh, we have the crew flight mission, um, a crew, uh, the CFT mission for Boeing, at currently no earlier than July 21st. Uh, we have kind of a high beta cutout in July, so we have to schedule around that. Um, and then we have in August, we have the crew exchange on Dragon, and then in September, um, crew exchange on Soyuz. So we do have quite a, a bit of traffic. I would not say it's additionally any more crowded than it has been, and um, if anything, we, we have some sort of built-in breaks in there. Um, what can happen is if we have a launch slip, it can crowd up against the next mission, and so we'll be keeping an eye on that. Uh, right now, I'd say it's well-placed. Um, but of course, it, could, it can always uh, it can always slip and get get more crowded as we go. 
So we do have a question on the phone. We'll be going to Bill Harwood. Bill? Yeah, thank you. This is for Dina, I think. Um, you mentioned one of the existing uh, arrays is going to get an IROSA that uh, you, you phrase it as a loss of power. I'm, I'm trying to remember, wasn't there an array that did have more than just degradation involved, and is this one of them, and which power channel is that? Um, and also, are there any plans for a fourth set of IROSAs uh, to fill out those last two um, arrays? Any, anything coming up in that regard? Thanks. Sure. So first, uh, regarding the, what I was referring to on the degradation, the one Bravo channel actually did have back in November, as I recall, um, an issue uh, where potentially what we, what we believe happened is we had some micrometeorite orbital debris that hit uh, one edge of the array and it kind of propagated a failure. So we actually lost some strings of power uh, on one edge of the array. And so in December, during one of those spacewalks, we had the crew actually unplug that part of the array so that that would keep uh, that, that isolated, that portion isolated. So we do actually have um, a, a portion of power on the 1B array that is not, uh, one portion that's basically missing. And so when we overlay this IROSA over the top of it, um, it's like overlaying non-functional pieces of that array. Uh, and so it actually is a, a great augmenting um, piece of equipment uh, for us. So that was the example I was talking about there, so maybe that's what you're referring to, Bill. Um, and then regarding the fourth set of arrays, we do have plans in place to try and um, build a fourth set of arrays. Of course, uh, funding uh, notwithstanding, but that is our plan, is to try to build a fourth set. Thank you, Bill, for your question. Uh, so I have another question here, um, kind of about the preparations so how does a spacewalk officer, how does mission control prepare for a spacewalk like this? Do you interact with the crew? Absolutely. So there's quite a bit of preparation and training long before crew even gets on board. So for us, we trained both at the neutral buoyancy laboratory, the big pool that has a lot of our hardware underwater that simulates being in weightlessness. And so both Steve and Woody were able to do that training before they flew specifically for these EVAs to walk through the sequencing and see it. They also got a chance to see the actual flight hardware uh, before it was packaged for flight on SpaceX 28, right before they launched on orbit. And since then, we've been sending them lots of training material. We have conferences with them uh, pretty regularly leading up to the spacewalk where we go back and forth and make sure that they're comfortable with our procedures and our plans, and we address any questions they have or any additional training needs they may have before they actually perform the spacewalk. Looks like we have a follow-up question from Bill on the phone. Oh, yeah, thank you very much. And this is also for Dina. Um, I know this is, this is an EVA uh, briefing, but you did mention X2, so I feel like I can ask you about CFT. Uh, you know, the, the ASAP raised questions about parachutes or cited issues with that. Uh, the GAO had a report out yesterday talking about computer displays that randomly reboot. Um, it doesn't sound like uh, CFT is in very good shape for July. Can you give us any kind of an update at all about what's going on with that mission? Thanks. Sure. Well, so uh, back on May 25th, we did do a review of where are we um, and issues that um, the, the ASAP has brought up. Um, and we were, we're going to also hold an additional one uh, next week. Uh, so I'd say that um, all the teams are trying to work to methodically close all, the, all of the issues that have been raised um, and, and all the um, certification necessities. Um, and so those are not all closed yet, and we are uh, continuing to work through that. Uh, again, we, we are still no earlier than July 21st at this time, but we'll have readiness reviews. Um, we'll, we'll have reviews uh, also leading up to um, pro, uh, prop load, so propellant load which is gonna happen more in the mid-June timeframe. So um, there's more to come on that. Uh, we'll, of course, keep everybody updated. Um, that's the only update I have at this point, though, Bill. Thank you, Dina. Uh, getting back to their space box, we have a question from Twitter from Dawn um, about, about the history of these legacy solar arrays. Um, how long have they been up there? Sorry, trying to read this one. How long has it been since the solar arrays have been coming I'm sorry, Dawn, I'm butchering your question. Uh, how long has it been since the solar arrays have been up there, and how long have we been upgrading them? Well, let's see. I'm probably the oldest one on the panel, so <laughs> I, I'll have to take a stab at that. Um, but <clears throat> let's see. So 
P6 was um, uh, our first array, um, and um, it basically sat on top of the middle of the truss for a while, and then we relocated it to the end uh, after we got the um, S4 and P4 arrays up there. Um, I would say probably, well, certainly early 2000s, that will definitely hit the, hit the mark, I think, um, as in terms of when they, those went up. I think S6 went up around 2000 and, well, again, maybe early 2000s, I'd say. Um, so they've been up there quite a long time. So, uh, you know, some of them almost 20 years. Uh, and so that, I think, answers that question. Um, and they have really actually performed very, very well. Uh, early on in assembly, we did have issues with um, redeploy and, and uh, that sort of thing. Um, but since then, they've really been operating very, very well. The only thing, uh, like I, s I mentioned, was MMOD. We had a micrometeroid orbital debris strike. Um, and so we watched that kind of carefully. And occasionally, we'll lose a cell here or there to something like that. Uh, and then, um, you know, we uh, just have its standard, I say standard degradation of, of what happens when uh, things are in space a long time. And I think the second part of that question is how long have we been upgrading with these IROSAs? Oh, with the IROSAs, let's see. So first IROSA EVA, help me. Two years ago is when we did the first outboard <laughs> set for P6. And so that was the two outboard arrays that we upgraded. And then we did the last set, the middle set now, um, just this last December for the inboard arrays. And those are operating very, very well, even better than expected. So those are all of the questions that I have on social media and on the phone. Any final questions here in the room? <laughs> all right, thank you everybody. Uh, so everyone who submitted their questions, our coverage for Spacewalk 87 begins on Friday, June 9th at 7.45 a.m. Eastern. The astronauts will officially begin their spacewalk around 9.15 a.m. You can watch the action live on NASA TV, nasa.gov, or on your NASA app. That's it for today. Thanks for joining.